Uh, good morning, Family Life, and for all those who are tuning in with us on uh, via the internet, uh, we're glad you're here on this uh, Sunday morning. Uh, we're going to give you a little bit of announcements before we get into the message and some time of worship. Uh, I hope you guys are doing uh, uh, some safe practices out there. Hope everything's fine. I hope you guys are feeling safe. I uh, hope that the fears are residing a little bit. Uh, so I, uh, I just want you guys to know we've been praying for you guys. Um, we miss you guys, but we know that these are the things that we need to do. And so uh, if you have any questions, definitely give us a call, some needs. So there's a few things we want to talk about. If you have some prayer needs, uh, what we're doing is we're putting together a connection card that you normally would have seen here. We're going to be putting it uh, on our website. You will have it in your emails, and you can find it in the little link bef- below the, the caption on the YouTube videos as well. So uh, this will give you an opportunity to, to keep us abreast of, to your prayer needs and whatnot. Also, our care groups are meeting still for those who want to meet. Others are meeting in different formats, uh, but we are providing a lot of safety uh, precautions. When we do meet, we have some space and whatnot, but there's a lot of fellowship going on. So if you have any questions about wanting to be part of a care group, we're going to give you some new times uh, in this upcoming week. Also, we talked about in my update about the Joseph Project, which is formerly known as our Benevolence Ministry. Uh, We do... um, I believe that there's going to be some needs coming our way, and so we, if you want to be part of that above your tithe, just uh, go to the website or just indicate on your, on your giving that you would like to give to the Joseph Project, and, uh, and we will make sure that it goes there. Also, our family needs page, uh, Pastor Brad will be heading that up. You'll be seeing some information on the website and our family needs page, and, uh, and he'll give you some instructions on how that works and how we're going to start that as well. Our messages, again, this message here will be obviously online. You're watching it as we speak. Uh, that'll be going on from this time forward, so uh, you'll be able to come back to that. And they'll be up and running at 10 a.m. on each Sunday morning. Uh, but right now, you know, we want to be able to... Um, give you an opportunity. You could do it. You could push pause now, or you could do it right after the message, right after the worship. Whatever you want to do in your home is, this is also a time we can remember Jesus. Uh, Some people call it communion or the Lord's Supper, but uh, of all the times to remember the Lord, this is the time to remember the Lord, to remember who He is, what He has done, and that folks, one day He is coming back for us. And so if you want to take some time to just kind of read a passage of Scripture and uh, maybe something out of Hebrews and, and be able to remember the Lord, you could do that. And uh, we're going to be giving you some uh, communion cups that actually have the bread and the cup and the juice all in one. Uh, we'll be providing that to you uh, probably this next week as well. But also a time of giving. Uh, again, this is between you and the Lord. You will find different ways in which you can give. So go to our website. Kevin will provide some opportunities in which ways you can give. You can drop it by the church office. There's a giving box inside the church office. Um, we need to continue to give and put God first in our lives. So right now, we, what we want to do is we want to just uh, pause. I want to pray with you. And then after I'm done praying with you, uh, Kevin's going to lead us in a couple songs of worship. And, uh, and then we'll get into the message. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for this time that you have given us an opportunity to be able to connect with one another, to be able to hear your word, to worship together, to give, to remember, and so, Father, and to pray. And so, Father, we thank you for all that you have provided. I thank you for every person that's watching this right now. Let them know how much you love them, you care for them, that they're not alone. And uh, and I just pray that we will uh, be sensitive to the promptings of people's names in our hearts and minds so we can contact them and let them know that they're cared for and not forgotten. So, Father, just be with this uh, uh, service today. Father, may it honor you. May you be glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever see Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. And 
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to the Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. In holy, there is no one like. Close like no other. I know you have 
as a father Well, we uh, again welcome you back to our series called uh, Jesus is Greater, uh, Never Give Up. It's a study through the book of Hebrews. Uh, we were doing one chapter a week. Uh, we're on chapter 12, and I'll tell you what, it's one of the most uh, powerful books you will ever read and study because it really speaks about what we're going through in life because the reality is, is that we do live in a broken world. Would you agree we live in a broken world? We do. We do. And so we've been walking through and we've been seeing so many different things going on. And, and it's not so uncommon to what's going through the lives of the Jewish Christians over 2,000 years ago. Before I get into that, I want to tell you just a, a joke, okay? Sometimes we need to laugh during this time. So that we're going to be speaking about kingdoms today and whatnot, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. But, but there was this king. He knew that his time on earth was at hand, and he knew he needed to pass the reins of leadership on, so he needed to find the right person who was brave enough to take that position. And so, so he uh, had this nationwide contest that he put together that the first man to cross his alligator pool without being harmed will be given an option to either uh, have half of his kingdom, either a million dollars or his daughter's hand in marriage. And sure enough, the herald went out throughout the kingdom, 
proclaimed the news, and before you knew it, there was miles upon miles of people standing at the, at the front of that uh, alligator pool. And so as he was beginning to congratulate him for being there and uh, to restate the instructions, before you knew it, the first guy jumped in. He jumped in, and he swam across that alligator pool, almost like on top of the water, and he made it to the other side without one scratch on him. Everybody was amazed. The king was amazed. So he says, bring him up here. I need to talk to this man who's, who's got this, this, this you know, skin of steel. And so he uh, brought him up there, and he says, young man, you have absolutely impressed me. So let me ask you, so what do you want? Do you want a million dollars? He says, nope. He goes, Oh, you want up to half my kingdom? He says, nope. He goes, oh, you are a wise and brave man. You know that if you marry my daughter, you will get it all eventually. So you want to marry my daughter? And he goes, no. He says, what do you mean no? You don't want a million dollars? You don't want up to half my kingdom? You don't want my daughter's hand in, my, in marriage? I'm confused. So tell me, what do you want? He says, I want five minutes with the guy who pushed me in. And maybe you want five minutes with a person who's pushed you away from the toilet paper aisle. You know, times can be a little scary, but, uh, but there is a time to laugh, as in, uh, we've learned in Ecclesiastes. And so, as we walk through the book of Hebrews, we're in chapter 12, but here's what I want to do is recap a little bit with you this morning, and that is this, is that the book of Hebrews... The, the actual, the preacher who is speaking to these people, they're in persecution, they're in difficult times. Their houses have been taken from them, jobs have been taken from them, they are in persecution from other uh, Jewish people, and they're struggling. And, and for some of them, they're starting to drift from their faith to the point where they're wondering, was it even worth it? Is it even worth it? So the writer begins in chapter 1 to really tell you who Jesus is, because what has happened is they have forgotten who their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. So he begins to lay out this, this whole uh, list of titles that they are very much familiar with, like angels. They said, oh yeah, angels? You think angels are powerful? Well, let me tell you something. Jesus is more powerful. Oh, you think the prophets are powerful? Let me tell you something. Jesus is way greater than the prophets. Oh, you think the apostles are powerful? Or you think the priests are powerful? You go through all the titles. You think Moses was powerful? Abraham was powerful? You think, you know, all these prophets that we are, are reminded uh, of their faith and of their uh, ministry, he says, let me tell you something, Jesus is greater than they are. He's greater than all of them. And then the whole shadowy figure of Melchizedek, and he says, you know what? Don't worry about who he was, but know this, that Jesus is greater than Melchizedek. He's a priest from another priesthood, and, um, and it's one that will never end. And so he goes through and he talks about that in times like this, we ought to draw closer to Christ, not further away. And then you go in through this whole process of just understanding how the tabernacle was put together and the purpose of that and the Holy of Holies. And then you get into chapter 10 where we talk about this, this fact that you have gotten into this habit of not meeting together. You're not encouraging each other. You need to be together in times like this to encourage one another until the capital D, until Christ comes. Don't give up. Don't give up, brother. Don't give in. Don't give up, sister. That's what we're supposed to do together. And so we have to find creative ways to be together because Satan wants to divide and conquer. And that's what, that's what he's going to try to do during this time. But we must fight that and stay connected. And then last week, Paul, uh, not Paul, but uh, uh, maybe he thinks he's Paul, but Brad, Brad did a great job in, uh, in, in bringing you the message of, uh, of Hebrews chapter 11. And what Hebrews chapter 11 was about people, ordinary people like you and me. They were people that trusted God, that said yes to God. These were people that had gone through various persecution and hardships and difficulties, and they were insulted. It says that the world was not even worthy to have them in their presence. And uh, as a result of that, they became these, these like this um, heroes of faith. And, but they didn't receive the promises we have as, as Christians. And so, so then he transitions into chapter 12 where he's beginning to tell them, you have something greater than all the heroes of faith of the Old Testament up to this point because you have Jesus Christ, you have the church, you have the Holy Spirit. 
And he's beginning to kind of, you know, tell them that it's time to rise up and quit living in fear and focus your attention on the one who's the perfecter of your faith. So in verse 1 of chapter 12, it starts off this way, Therefore, because we just talked about all the heroes of faith, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, a cloud of witnesses. Now, he's not really saying that there's some stadium out there in heaven that all these uh, heroes of the faith before us are just sitting there and just cheering us on. Their stories, their life of faith is cheering us on. Matter of fact, I was reading this last week that Napoleon Bonaparte began his Egyptian campaign and he pointed to the pyramids and he shouted to his soldiers. He says, soldiers, there are, there's 40 centuries looking down on us right now. I think in a sense it's kind of the same thing. All the people from the time of Adam and Eve until now that said yes to God, I trust God, I believe in God, He's greater than anything I faith face he has their testimony before us and then we take this time and we remember and we are surrounded by their stories of faith and maybe you have somebody in mind when I talk about that I think about people in my past that people that through very difficult times they didn't give up they didn't give in they got knocked down but they kept They kept going because they kept trusting God. They knew something was greater than their pain. And so he says, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So he says, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So he's basically saying, like an athlete, an athlete who's getting prepared to, to run in the race says, you know what, i got to lose a few pounds. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but being at home, I think we're all going to have to say that in a few weeks or not. You know, we're going to have to lose a few pounds because it's kind of weighing us back. But here it's kind of comparing it to sin. What is it in your life that's weighing you down? What is holding you back? And that's what he's trying to talk about is that we need to cut loose of the doubts and the fears and of the sins in our life, so that we can get up and we can start running. We can start running in faith. And he says, and in, in doing so, verse 2 says, looking to who? Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Why is he that? Why is he the, the founder and perfecter of our faith? Because Jesus started his ministry in faith. He ended in faith. For it is finished, he says on the cross. He raises from the grave. Then he ascends back to the Father. He is our example of one who is faithful to the Father. So no matter how difficult it is, no matter how hard it is, we have Jesus to look at. He is the one to follow. And he says this, he says, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And where is he at now? He is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The right hand of the throne of God. Folks, one day, all the pain we experience will be silenced. will be gone. But until then, there's going to be moments of pain. There's going to be moments of sadness and sorrow and loss. That's just, that's the byproduct of living in a broken world. But if we hang in there and we don't give up, we don't give in, we keep looking up, we, let, we fix our eyes upon Jesus, who is, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, that we can look beyond our pain to this place where we will be with the Lord forever. And that's the hope that he's trying to give us here, is that that's where Jesus is and that's where we need to follow. And then in verse 3, he says this. He says about not growing weary. He says, consider him, Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. He says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And here's what he's talking about, is that during the times of living out your faith, you're going to have people that are going to criticize you. You're going to have people that are going to persecute you. They're going to laugh at you. In Jesus' case, they're going to hang you out on a cross. He says, it's going to happen, but don't lose heart. It's going to happen. Every time you let your light shine before men, men are going to try to douse it out with their darkness and their fears. 
And he says, don't do that. Don't do that. He says, in your struggle against sin, against the sin of this world, you have not resisted, resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. Listen to what he says. He says, my son, my daughter, <clears throat> do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastise every son whom he receives. Now, I don't know about you, but I think when people read this about God disciplines those he loves, I don't know when's the last time your mom and dad or somebody disciplined you that you said, thank you so much. That, that, was, that was so wonderful. You know, Dad, when you, when you disciplined me this last week, I thought, wow, what a wonderful father I have. And Mom, when you put me in time out, that was the right place for me. You know, folks, a lot of times we don't say those things or think those things. We think like, man, I want to be anywhere else but then in the midst of this discipline. But God says, you know what? Life is a lesson for all of us. If you want to live on the pathway of righteousness, then you're going to learn it through the disciplines of this world, whether they are brought on by you and sinful man or just circumstances that happen, kind of like this coronavirus. Some things that's out of our control. But if we are trained by that, then righteousness comes. And listen to what he says. It is for discipline that you have to endure. And here's what I want to say about that is that in our country, I've shared this many times, when things like this happen, when life happens, when we pray to God, we, this is what our prayers are typically, uh, what they're like, is that, uh, God, would you please take this away from me? Some of you may be praying, Lord, take this virus away. Take this persecution away. Take this trial and this trouble away. I don't think that's what God wants us to pray. Here's what I think he wants us to pray is this, Lord, give me the strength to endure during this time of discipline. This, during this time, it has a, it's a great opportunity to trust you more, to reach out further, to love better. That's what it's about. And when we start changing our prayers, and if the enemy has his fingers on our family at all, he's going to remove them because he don't want us stronger. Because God wants us faithful. He wants us faithful. He says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Well, when this was written, folks, one of the things that we sometimes have a hard time relating to is the fact that when we read anywhere in Scripture about a earthly father, we have a difficult time connecting with our heavenly father because maybe our earthly father was absent, he was abusive, he was silent, he wasn't there. And so we sometimes will falsely think that that's what God's going to be. If my earthly dad wasn't there or abusive, we tend to view it through that lens that God is abusive when I read his word. You know, the shell knots and all the different commands. Uh, or God doesn't even listen. He created the earth and left. You'll see that. Um, but that's one of the biggest mistakes we can make is to ever compare the creation of God to the creator, God. But see... Back during this time, they seen it as high value to be a good dad, to raise your kids, to leave them well prepared. And so they understood this, that even though these men were sinful, they tried to do their best and discipline their children to prepare them for life. For a lot of us and nowadays, that's not happening. A lot of times kids will keep growing up and also they're gone and they are not prepared. There's a new word out there that is just ravaging families and communities. It's called extended adolescence. It's kids that never grow up. They still live as if they're at home with mom and dad. But there's a time that we've got to leave and cleave. We've got to be responsible and move ahead. And that's what happened during this time. He said, besides this, they've had earthly fathers who disciplined them, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? I mean, here, if this is our, heavenly, our earthly father, he says, don't even compare our heavenly father with them. He's way above them, as high as the heavens above the earth. He says, my ways are above yours, my thoughts are above your thoughts. 
So God, if, this, if Dad's trying to do his best and we, were, we respected him for it, how much more will God, who's doing it? See, with that, verse 10 says, For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but the discipline's for us for good, that we may share in his holiness. See, God wants us to be holy. He wants us to be on the right pathway of life, the, 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 the pathway of righteousness. Verse 11 says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Can I get a big amen out there? Amen. amen. But later it says it yields the peaceful, would you circle that in your Bible, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You want peace now? Then you endure the disciplines of God, of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. C.S. Lewis said this, he says, God whispers to us in our pleasure, speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. He shouts in our pain. And let me tell you something. Brothers and sisters and those who are watching this, um, this is a Job moment in your life. You see, the Job moment was, is why is this happening to me? I didn't cause this. I didn't create this. Why is this happening to me? And you remember what Satan said about Job to God? The only reason why they, he praises you is because you bless him. You give him all this stuff. But if you took it away, I guarantee you he'd curse you to your face. Folks, those times of testing aren't just with Job. They're with us as well. That the only reason why these children of God are blessing you is because you give them a warm home, you give them a job, you give them you know, a bank account, you give them toilet paper. Do you know what I'm talking about? As a result of that is that if you take it away from them, God... Watch them curse you to their face, your face. Brothers and sisters, we must not fall for that trap. One of the things we talked about this last week is that God is a jealous God. Deuteronomy tells us he's a jealous God. And he will go after fiercely every God we put our fingers on. Because these are not gods at all, whether it's the God of money, or the God of, of title, or the God of our security, the God of whatever, of our health. God's a jealous God because, see, these gods, as you can see right now, are not helping us at all. The God of government. So God's going to say, you know what? The only one you can trust during these difficult times is me. I'm the only true God. And when we can trust in that and let go of these other false gods, then our strength in Jesus Christ will grow. So he's given these times of testings. Verse 12 says, Therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet. Why? So that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, stop living in a pity party. Stop living there because you're not helping anybody. They're just becoming more afraid when you're afraid. He says, God is in this. Greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. Believe that. You're the, you're the agents of hope. That's what our, we are as believers. So get up. Lift your drooping hands and weak knees and go find somebody who's weak. Look around your neighborhood. Look in your own family. Find somebody who's saying, I'm struggling in my faith. And you walk alongside them and you share hope to them that it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. That's our time. This is our time. Should we have always been living this way? Absolutely. But God is helping us in our faith. That it's not found in an auditorium. It's not found in a program. It's found in His people who trust Him. Who trust Him in all things. So who is it that you need to reach out to? Verse 14 says, strive for peace with everyone. That's going to be hard when you go to Costco. I get that. With everyone. And for the holiness without which no one else will see the Lord. Verse 15 says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. He says that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. Here's what he's talking about. There is this drifting that can take place during times of persecution and trials and troubles. 
That's what this whole thing's about is that I don't know if I trust God. I don't know if I trust God. You begin to drift. He says, sure that up. Because what will happen is you'll miss the grace of God if you drift from God. So you have to sure that up. Esau thought because he was hungry that his birthright was worthless. So he sold it for one stinking meal. And then later on, Jacob gets the blessing. Yes, he was deceiving at the time. He gets the blessing. And God gives him the blessing because God's a God of faithfulness. But then when he comes in and says, hey, Father, I'm ready for the blessing. He says, I'm sorry. I thought you were Jacob. And I gave it to him. And listen to what it says here. It says here, who sold his birthright for a single meal. Verse 17, for you know that afterward... When he desired to inherit the blessing, he came back. He was what? He was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Here's what he's saying. A lot of people disagree, but here's what it's talking about. You can't keep drifting from God without consequence. And what Esau did is he went to this place where he sold his birthright. Jacob picked it up. He wanted it, and he says, it's too late. You can cry all you want. It's not going to happen. You had your chance. We cannot drift in our faith so far that we get to the place where repentance is it's impossible. It's impossible. It's too late. It's too late. That's why we've got to sure up and pay attention today. So let's look at 18, verse 18. He says, um, uh, this is a kingdom that, that he's, he's promising us. He says, it's a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Verse 18 says, for you have not come to what may be touched. Now he's speaking of this time in which Moses was on Mount Sinai and all the people of God were below. And there was just this scene that took place that was just fearful with everybody there. He says, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. Here's what happened is that God is speaking the power of himself and it was so frightening that they're yelling, Moses, stop it, have him stop so that you can speak. And Moses is like, I'm fearful as well. Can you imagine the scene where God's presence and his power is being displayed and everybody's riddled in fear? If we are going to fear, brothers and sisters, it's not because of the coronavirus and our government and all the things out there. If there's someone to fear, who is it? It's God alone. He says, do not, Jesus says, do not fear man because the worst thing he can do to you is take your body, take your life. See, some of you think, well, that's a big deal. It's not if you're securing Christ, it's not a big deal. Matter of fact, the worst thing that can happen to you would be the very best thing that can happen to you. But he says, fear the one that only can kill your body but throw your soul in hell. That's the one you must fear. Fear God. I'm hearing all over the country people who have drifted in their faith are frightened right now because they're wondering, Where, what did I do? I had stronger faith at one point, but, I, but I'm struggling now. And they don't know what to do. And so they're trying to control the circumstances around them, and it's not working. you got to open your hands. you got to get to your knees. And you got to cry out to God and say, God, I need your help. I can't do this without you. That's your prayer. That's your position. And so with that, he says, For they could not endure the order that was given. He says, Even if even a beast touches the mountain... It shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Moses was afraid in the presence of a holy God. Verse 22 says, but you have come to Mount Zion. He's talking about these are the people of the Old Testament. That's what's happening. Now you are the people of the New Testament. You have come to Mount Zion in the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And to innumerable angels in the festival gatherings, and to the assembly of the firstborn. You guys are among the firstborn of those going to heaven with the new covenant of the righteous made perfect. 
And he says, verse 24, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sp- sprinkled blood that speaks, what? A better word than that of the blood of Abel. See, Abel was the first human to physically die. And when God confronted Cain, he said, Your brother's blood cries out to me that the world is busted. And there's fear. And there's fighting. And there's anger. And there's all of this brokenness. He said, but Jesus' blood cries out even greater that there's life. And there's hope. And there's salvation. And that there's a better, a better Jerusalem. That's for all of us. Verse 25 He says, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Do not refuse the Lord. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. See, God is crying out. And you know what? I'm not a prophet and I don't claim to be a prophet. But you know, I believe God's on a God, little g, God killing, um, uh, campaign right now because he loves us that much that he's taking aim at all the things we put our trust in and see what's happening is that he loves us that much and he's wanting us to cry out to him not to the things of this earth to hear the voice from heaven. He is crying out. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt that some of you right now, you're feeling him speaking to you right now. I don't know who you are, but God does. He knows where you're at in your despair, discouragement, and doubt. He wants you to trust him. Open your hands. Reach out to his and let him pick you up with his righteous right hand. That's what he wants. He's waiting for you to do so. He says, verse 26, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Do you imagine the thunder of that, the power of that? Verse 27 says, This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of the things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Verse 28 says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with a reverence and awe. Why? Verse 29, let's say this together. For our God is a consuming fire. Here's the deal. Jesus came the first time to save us from our sins. He's the great high priest. His blood was sufficient to forgive us of our sins. And for those who believe on him, they'll receive eternal life, right? But he's coming back again, not to save us from our sins, but to judge the world. The wrath of God is coming. And I'm not saying that what we're going through right now is connected to the complete wrath of God. God is allowing it to take place, but it's a reminder, though, that there's so many things out of our control. So we need to go to the person who's in control, and that's God himself. Hebrews chapter 12 is an amazing chapter. Chapter 13, we'll finish up next week. And, um, but here's the deal. Wherever Jesus Christ finds you this morning, just offer your life to him the best way you know how. He loves you. He promised you. And next week, you know what? I'm going to be able to share one of my life verses, and that's Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money. Pretty relevant right now, right? And be content with what you have. For God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So I say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? That's what we're talking about next week. And it's relevant to our time today. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, get a hold of us. Let us know how we can help with that. Uh, We can still baptize maybe six feet away, but we can do it. Now, God is in this. God is with you. And see, God is on his throne. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this time, Father. We thank you for this day. Father, you're your God alone. Father, may we fix our eyes upon you, the author and perfecter of our faith, that we do not focus on our fears, our problems, our circumstances. We focus on you. 
And when we focus on you, Lord, everything begins to shrink because you're far greater than anything. And in these times of discipline, Father, of living in a broken world, Father, may we learn and be trained by it that we rise up in faith and trust you that it's going to be okay. Nothing's going to happen to me or my family that doesn't cross the desk of God first. Trust in that. Be with all the people that are hurting right now, people who feel unloved and lonely. Father, may they just realize that you will never leave them nor forsake them. You love them with an everlasting love. Help us to love better as your people. Help us to be sensitive to the people around us. Be patient with those whose faith is weak. And Father, but through it all, may everything that we say and all that we do glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.